Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day, Lil. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Hello there. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. The Eric Erickson Show around the country. The phone number, if you'd like to be on the program, 877-97-ERIC. 877-973-7425. Washington, D.C. is on pace right now for more than one carjacking a day. There have been 37 carjackings of of January 20th. There have been 200 car thefts this month. The car thefts are outpacing COVID hospitalizations in the District of Columbia. Interesting. Crime wave galore. And, you know, a lot of the crimes are happening um, at night, the violent crimes in particular, but... There's still crimes, and it's still loss of life and loss of property, among other things. And, and increasingly, the carjacking jackings are they're bolder and happening in broad daylight in big cities. This is a problem, but it's one I don't necessarily want to talk about at the moment. I want to talk about the Supreme Court. It is increasingly conventional wisdom, some are a little skeptical still, but increasingly conventional wisdom that perhaps the Supreme Court is going to end Roe versus Wade. Now today, the Supreme Court has announced it will reconsider race-based affirmative action in college admissions. This is a story here from CNN from their fairly progressive coverer of the Supreme Court. The justices said they will hear challenges to policies at Harvard and the University of North Carolina that use students' race among many criteria to decide who should gain a coveted place in an entering class. The case will be heard beginning in October with a decision likely in June of 2023. High court conservatives, this again, this is reading from CNN, have increasingly cast aside decades-old decisions and their acceptance of the appeals immediately throws in doubt precedents from 1978 and 2003 that let colleges consider students' race to enhance campus diversity and the educational experience. I have a question. I have a question. What's the use of a 6-3 Supreme Court conservative majority if they're not going to use it? What's the use? Why have a conservative majority if you're not going to use the conservative majority? John Roberts, back in, uh, I guess, 2006, said, and I quote, it is a sordid business, this divvying us up by race. The way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. End quote. That was John Roberts. In the past, Sandra Day O'Connor, when she was on the Supreme Court, suggested the time would come when we needed to stop using affirmative action in hiring practices and in college admissions. That day, according to the court thus far, has not come. John Roberts took the position that if you want to stop discriminating based on race, do it and do it now. John Roberts has been a reliable vote to kill race-based preferences for colleges. Now, the author at CNN and others always like to point out that it's benefited black and Hispanic students. Not necessarily, though. When you look at the long-term data, a lot of kids get into colleges 
who otherwise would not have based on grades alone and then can't cut it. And it has a debilitating mental effect on the kids who get into college and realize they were there based on the color of their skin, not because of their academic merit. It has allowed, in some cases, public schools as well to continue to be crap public schools, not improve, knowing ah, our kids are still going to get to college because they're not white. We have essentially built an entire educational apparatus around race that gives kids an academic pass based on the color of their non-white skin without making them do the work or requiring that they get the good education. We are, in effect, a, a engaged in a racism that says black and Hispanic kids can't cut it in the real world. We need to give them a leg up based on the color of their skin. And you know who gets disadvantaged the most? It's not actually the white kids. It's the Asian kids. For some reason, well, the reason is actually obvious. The left just can't process it. Asian kids tend to be the best academically. Whether from Southeast Asia or from Northeast Asia, they tend to. And so the situation is that Harvard and other schools have discriminated against Asian students because they are so academically successful and discriminates in favor of kids who aren't as academically successful. If you want to stop discriminating on race, stop discriminating on race. You know, there is something to be said here on the other side of the coin, and, and we don't like to talk about this in polite society because, you know, you're, you're called a racist when you do, but it's real, it's true. When businesses and universities engage in affirmative action, neither the other employees nor the employee or student who benefits from it knows if they benefited based on the color of their skin or their own success. Did the non-white person get the good job because of their merits or because of the color of their skin? It leaves a doubt to fester in the air and it breeds resentment and keeps racism perpetuated. And it provides easy excuses for society itself to not have to do the hard work of pulling people up into academic and societal success. We can just say, nah, well, we'll give them a leg up. We'll give them some bonuses because of the color of their skin. It's a problem. It's a problem that festers in society. And now this gets us further into the Supreme Court. If you have a 6-3 conservative majority, 5-4 maybe if you don't count Roberts, I would count him generally. He's a fairly reliable conservative, whether you like him or not. Not always, but more reliable than an Anthony Kennedy when it comes to voting on the right. If you got a conservative Supreme Court majority, why are we on defense? We can let the liberals in the press lament, oh, this is a rollback of Supreme Court precedent. But, you know, those Supreme Court precedents were a bunch of liberal precedents. Why can't we roll them back? Why must we be bound to stare decisis? Stare decisis is the uh, court term for adhering to prior precedent. If the prior precedent's bad, why can't we roll it back? Well, the left says you can't because those prior precedents tend to be liberal precedents. But if they were decided badly, why can't we? If the court got it wrong, why should the court's decisions be adhered to? Now, there is a philosophical legal argument that we should be slow to roll back prior court precedent because we want a dependable, stable legal regime in the country to do business. Countries that uh, have fly-by-night governments and judicial decisions that go back and forth very easily, countries subject to bribe where people can get their way with the court through bribery and the like, 
They tend to be third world hell holes where nobody wants to invest money. In this country, we tend to be the gold standard for doing business in the country because you know the law is a fairly stable thing. And if the law flips back and forth based on control of the Supreme Court, it becomes a place where you cannot do business because what's legal today may be illegal tomorrow. What's regulated today may be unregulated tomorrow and vice versa. But along the way, we should not have a default to liberalism on the Supreme Court when the Supreme Court is conservative. There are liberals, in fact, I've seen the argument today, oh, well, conservatives are just outsourcing their gains to the Supreme Court and letting the court system give them their wins when they lose politically in this country. First of all, we got to this point because conservatives were winning politically. But secondly, for 50 years, the left has used the judiciary to score gains it could not get in the legislature at the executive level. For all of the pessimism about the advance of liberals in the United States, they actually have done pretty poorly advancing. Conservatives have a 6-3 Supreme Court majority because conservatives were winning at the ballot box. Conservatives have not had to wage war through the judiciary in large part because they were winning at the executive and legislative level. It was the left that had to play at the le- at the judiciary. And to the extent right now that the right is making gains and winning politically in the Supreme Court, it has everything to do with rolling back the gains the left got. It's not like conservatives are rushing to the Supreme Court to undo years of conservative control of Congress and the White House. They're rushing to court to get the conservatives on the court to undo the gains progressives themselves made in court and send those issues back to the legislature where conservatives are doing pretty well nationwide. Roe versus Wade is an example of this. If Roe versus Wade is thrown out by the Supreme Court tomorrow, it does not ban abortion in the United States. It says that the states themselves, through the legislatures, get to decide the issue. But on this issue of race-based preferences, it has been a progressive idea that because we failed non-white kids, we should give them racial preferences to get into colleges. They don't want to fix the schools. They don't want to acknowledge left-wing social policy has destroyed families. You know, the Asian kids do so well in schools because they have the most intact families where the parents actually make the kids do their work. And it benefits them long-term. Stable families build stable societies regardless of race. The left doesn't want to acknowledge that because they've been at war with the family forever. And in so doing, as they brought about the collapse of families, they put in race-based preferences in schools and hiring to give kids from decayed parts of society a leg up on society because they can't acknowledge that their own liberal left-wing policies have destroyed families and communities. They just want to scream racist when you point it out. And now they become the racists. They have become the ones who say, hold on, let us treat people differently based on the color of their skin. Now those days may be coming to an end. The Supreme Court taking this case, it's been fairly standard for a while now that we've allowed these cases to slide. We've allowed these cases to move forward. It's nice, however, it's nice to see him change. Just got an email here from a lawyer in Atlanta. Says, in the University of Michigan affirmative action case, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor said it was her hope that in 25 years, there would not be a need for affirmative action anymore. It's been 19 years instead of 25 years, but her reasoning still stands. Admissions decisions need to be based on merit. That's what John Roberts has said. And you got Clarence Thomas there. You got Sam Alito there. You got John Roberts there. You got Neil Gorsuch there. All you need is Kavanaugh or Barrett or both. And suddenly, Sandra Day O'Connor's dream comes true. I'm not sure why conservatives should have to be on defense on the Supreme Court anymore. Again, this is very important. The Supreme Court with the conservatives, are not rolling back the legislative wins of the left. All they're doing is rolling back the judicial wins of the left, where the left went because they couldn't win 
at the legislature or the executive. Might as well do that. We got the Supreme Court. Might as well use it. I want to cut corners and just get to the chase. A lot of you hear podcast ads and radio ads for Bull and Branch, and you're thinking, eh, they're just telling you it because they're getting paid. I'm actually telling you it because I'm a customer. We actually have Bull and Branch sheets, and yes, they are an ad. Yes, this is an ad, but yes, I really am a customer. I only like to do ads for companies that I really like, and I love Bull and Branch. So does my wife. My wife actually heard the ads, and she wanted to try the sheets, and now they are the sheets in our house. Bull and Branch does not cut corners. They make super soft, wonderful sheets. They use the softest organic cotton they can find. They get better with every wash. They soften and soften and soften, and they only use 100% sustainable raw materials. They're the first fair trade certified manufacturer of linen. You can feel as good about your Bowling Branch sheets as they feel against your skin. They are so soft. They don't get too hot. They don't get too cold. They're just great. And every wash improves them. That, I'm telling you, is one of the coolest things about these sheets. It's like sleeping on a new bed every time you wash the sheets. It's great. Now, you can experience the best sheets you've ever felt at BowlinBranch.com. Get 15% off your first set of sheets when you use the promo code ERIC at checkout. That's BowlinBranch, B-O-L-L-A-N-D, Branch.com, promo code ERIC, E-R-I-C-K. I got to say, uh, my buddy Gary sent me a text message earlier, and it is my favorite meme of the week. The week is young, I realize, but it's fantastic. Better than the P- Patrick Mahomes one. Uh, never underestimate what you can do in 13 seconds again. Uh, um, the the, the I, and I had to clean that one up. But this one is, remember, Aaron Rodgers and the Packers can still make it to the Super Bowl if Mike Pence has enough courage. <laughs> wow, those games. I, I got to tell you, um, I have never been a huge football person. I, I never really have been. And then in the last year, I, I started with Philip, and uh, he comes over on Sunday nights. And our routine has been to sit and watch the NFL on the front porch, and now we'll watch hockey because uh, I'm not a basketball fan, and I'm I'm certainly not going to devote my attentions to basketball on Sunday nights. Uh, the the last sport where where the wokes are in control, it seems, is is the NBA. This sounds a little silly, more so to devote some level of a segment here, but just hang with me here for a minute. Um, in Sunday school on Sunday. We were in Galatians 6, and Paul was talking about sharing your burdens with one another. You can't really do that on Facebook or social media. It is, particularly at at my mid-40s now, I am increasingly mindful of the the need to have guy time, the need to have time with my friends. And men in particular tend to be worse about this than women. Men in particular tend to isolate themselves and feel like I can't go have fun with my friends because i got to take care of my, my family. They tend to have disservice. Or, on the other hand, they tend to never grow up and have Peter Pan syndrome, and they never want to have a commitment to family, and they're only with their friends. And it, it, essentially, you can't develop, in those sorts of ways, deep, meaningful friendships. You've got to have time with your friends. Now, I value time alone as well. I am believe it or not, fairly introverted. And I could sit alone by myself and enjoy my own company. But I realize I have to force myself to sit and develop my good friendships with friends who can share each other's burdens. It's not only scriptural, it just makes sense mentally, psychologically, philosophically for you to have friends and to sit with those friends on occasion without the distraction of your family and kids and to tell yourself you're not being selfish, you're doing it for your mental health. And you have to find balance in doing it. And sometimes you may enjoy it too much and spend too much time and, and you got to recalibrate for your family. But Sunday nights has become that time for me uh, to sit on the front porch uh, with just a, a small group of friends. Uh, sometimes it's just two of us and we can go 15, 20 minutes without saying a word to each other or we're watching a football game or a hockey game. But having that shared meaningful experience with real, physical, actual friends who are just your friends, 
who you can develop deep, meaningful relationships with. I really do think everybody needs to do it. To some extent, that's why I do recipes here. I, I More and more on Sunday nights, I cook. And sometimes it's fairly elaborate. Sometimes it's very rudimentary. But I provide the meal and the bourbon and the cigars for everybody. Nobody has to bring anything. Just bring yourself, sit on my porch. I can handle everything else in order to give themselves and myself a little bit of time just share in a football game and join each other's company. It's so I'm astonished by the number of people who don't do this, who not only don't do it, who, who can't even fathom that I make the time to do this. I'm telling you for your own well being and the health of your soul, you need to make time to actually disengage from your family a little while and spend time with friends. Uh, that's what Sunday nights have become for me, but find your time and do it. You really need to. Hello there, it is Eric Erickson here, The Eric Erickson Show. The phone number, should you wish to be a part of the program, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Let's go to the phones, JT. You're going to be up next. Welcome. Hey, how's it going, man? Great, how are you? I'm doing well. I really enjoy listening to your show. Um, I've been wanting to call in and tell you this little theory I came up with on a... uh, bourbon soaked night with my friends but those but, are always uh, good absolutely but it, it also checks out after the fact so that makes it even better um i've noticed that the far left wing has been going hard after what i've referred as diets um so they don't want communism but they want socialism well that's diet communism and then if you think about uh the cancel culture and all these people being silenced for speaking their side, well, that's diet fascism. And then when you have the uh, uh, affirmative action and all of this uh, uh, equity and all that, well, that's just diet racism. And I just wanted to get your opinion on all that. Man, you you know that that they got fat off the the hog here uh, through the judiciary for so long, giving them wins. And yeah, yeah, now now they're they're dieting and and making the rest of us miserable. You know... It, 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 spending time with your friends drinking bourbon can open the door to all sorts of <laughs> possibilities. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Yep. Sometimes good, sometimes bad, but but hopefully mostly good. You know, I, I like the way you're thinking there, though, uh, because you're right, and and I suspect it's part of their incrementalist approach, where they're going to give us a little bit of each of these things and get us used to it, and then they'll give us a little exactly. more, get us used to it, give us a little more, and pretty soon, next thing you know, we're we're, we're all out there speaking Russian. Um, and exactly. that's why you got to draw a line on this stuff. You know, the, and let's just go, go, go to your, your focus on here on, on the socialist aspect of it. I'm actually not that surprised when I look at the data of why so many young people are embracing socialism. Uh, but I forget where the study was. I saw it the other day that when a young person gets into the workforce and starts making money, they dramatically abandon, uh, their ideas on socialism. So the more jobs we have, I guess the better. But uh, okay, so now I got to ask, what 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 bourbon were you drinking? Uh, I'm a Maker's Mark man myself. All right, I, I got a bottle of it. I I, I you know that the the, um, the Four Roses single barrel has kind of become a, a front porch staple in my house. It's about the same price as the Maker's Mark these days, um, and of course you can't find any of them anymore. Uh, but I, I, I've enjoyed that one. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Um, I'm just waiting on my personal barrel to come to age oh, from the uh, distillery. Wow. wow. Well, now, you know, I, I I think I may want some full on communism and, and make those who have give to those of us who have not. And you'll have to share. With me. <laughs> hey, I'd share with you anytime, brother. <laughs> Thank you very much, JT. Appreciate the phone call. Uh, you, you know, though, on a less flippant note to JT's point, I, I, I do want for perspective to to at least have you understand why so many younger people now are embracing socialism? And I do think that young people, particularly right out of college have historically always embraced these things, but Gen Zers and younger millennials will tend to be the first people in this country whose lives are worse off than their parents economically. A lot of it you can say is by their own choices. Some of it, not necessarily so given the state of the economy and the like. And so that they're looking for solutions. And the problem here is they tend to be sympathetic to a lot of voices online and off that lean to the left. They have come out of academic institutions that lean left. So it's what they know. It's what they're comfortable with. 
getting them into jobs, into the workforce, uh, it does wonders on them, particularly when they get their paycheck and they see how much is already given to the government. They don't want more given to the government. But we, we've got to remember economically that this current generation is the one that if things don't go right very soon could genuinely be worse off than their parents. The first time that's happened in American history. And uh, we need to be mindful of that when we on the right approach and begin dialogue with them to persuade them the ideas they're advocating for are terrible. And we have really good historic footnotes and, and historic points to point out that uh, every country that has embraced socialism does worse than we do. Do they really want that? Now, uh, back to the phones. Matt, you're going to be up next. Welcome. Hey, Eric. Thanks for taking my call. And I also want to say thank you for that last segment on sharing your burdens. I think it's something that needs to be said loudly and frequently and, and unfortunately is not. Thank you. Um, so my question is slightly random, talking about uh, the universities and the Supreme Court made me uh, think of it. Um, do you think there is any chance that we can lessen the power of academia in this country and lessen the mentality of everyone goes to college by returning to a more apprenticeship model of, uh, you know, of, of learning for most, if not all professions. Uh, you know, I actually think a lot of professions would benefit from that model. Now, not all of them uh, at this day and age, given technologies and efficiencies would work for that. But I do think there actually are a lot of industries out there that could benefit. And, and frankly, I, we really are at the point in the country where you could make a great living in life without a college degree. And we have to deprogram that element of society to some degree where everyone thinks you got to go to college. You got to go to college. Now, everybody wants their kids to go to college. Uh, I think uh, I am the only one of my um, siblings who went all the way through college. Both of my parents got their college degrees, my mom later in life. Um, but a college degree to some degree is all about opening doors these days. It's not actually about the merits of the job. And, you know, let me speak on this real personally, man. And, and I appreciate the phone call. So I, I went to Mercer university in Macon, Georgia. I actually had a scholarship to go to Duke. All of you have heard of Duke, and if you're not in Georgia, probably very few of you have heard of Mercer, except for Mercer a few years ago in the NCAA basketball tournament beating Duke. I wound up going to Mercer instead of Duke because on my college trip with my dad looking at colleges, the people at Mercer were as nice as they could be. I was from a small town in Louisiana, had grown up in Dubai. My graduating class in Dubai was only 23 kids. That was ninth grade. Our school only went up to ninth grade at the time. Had 23 of us. We had gone all the way through school together, some floating in and out. I was one of the very few who had gone first through uh, ninth. Then I moved back to Louisiana, to rural Louisiana, to Jackson, Louisiana. And my graduating class was 89 kids. It was one of the smaller graduating classes the school had ever had. And none of my classes had more than 13 to 15 people in them. And I, so I was very comfortable in a small environment. And Mercer in Macon was small. And then I, I went up to my sister's. She lived in Virginia Beach. We wanted to see ODU. I wanted to go to Georgetown. We didn't make it up to Georgetown. But then we passed through Duke on the way home. And it was a miserable experience. And I had a scholarship. It was a beautiful campus, and the people were very much in the mode of, you need us, we don't need you. They were deeply unfriendly and deeply unhelpful, and I went to Mercer, and I don't regret it. I met my wife, met some lifelong friends, and to the degree I regretted it, it wasn't Duke, and people know Duke, but you know, I, I went to Mercer, and I stayed for law school, uh, and live in middle Georgia still. I liked the small environment. It was what I was comfortable with. The one thing I did not get from Mercer that you can get from a Duke or a Harvard or a Yale or even a UCLA is doors opening for me. Overwhelmingly, I have had to open those doors myself or have other people open them for me. You do not have the connections uh, and the legacies of a small school that you do from some of these prominent Ivy League schools. It is notable that at Harvard, as they are considering giving up and changing uh, their race-based admissions policies, they will not even consider 
giving up legacy admissions. It is uh, the thing that sets a Harvard education apart from a Mercer University education is not the quality and caliber of the teaching and the education. In fact, I would argue Mercer's probably better. It's the connections. It's the alumni directory. It's the ability to get doors open for you based on your uh, reputation of the school you went to and the people with whom you surrounded yourself. The future leaders of America come from the Ivy League, not because they have the character to lead, but because they have the connections and access. And a lot of getting through life is who you know, not what you know, and that's just the reality. And so if you go to a smaller school, you don't know the people who could open those doors for you. It's a tough lesson to learn sometimes. Life isn't fair, and I do find there to be a distinct irony that a lot of the people who advocate some level of imposed government fairness went to the Ivy League and had doors open for them through Ivy League connections and legacies, uh, and their daddies and mommies went to the Ivy League as well, and they lived this life of privilege where they want to lecture the rest of us on privilege. I think my education that I got at Mercer University was a fantastic education. It really was. Uh, working one-on-one with instructors, I wouldn't have necessarily gotten somewhere else. And it, it didn't have to deal at the time with all the nonsense you get on a lot of Ivy League campuses now. But I'm also mindful of the fact that I had to open a lot of doors myself that would have been open much better for me and easily and by other people had I gone to an Ivy League school or a more prestigious school. But through that hard work and, and uh, the one-on-one aspects of it, And my having to open the doors myself, I think it's gotten me in places in life where I might not have gotten otherwise had I gone to an Ivy League school. I don't necessarily know that you need to go to college anymore, though, to have a great career. I I don't know that you need to uh, tell your kid these days you must go to college to succeed in life. And in many cases, I think we're finding that the the bigger colleges and the prestigious colleges and the Ivy League colleges are where your kid's going to go and rot their brain. Many of them giving up on, for example, uh, the great books curriculum of Western civilization because they've become ashamed of it or think it's racist or misogynist in some ways when uh, these books really tell you how to think. You know, my kids go to a classical education Christian school where my wife and I had to be interviewed about our faith before our kids could go. And my kids are learning old school math. They're not learning common core math. They're learning old school history. They're not learning uh, the revised academic standards of history that some schools are teaching where they're downplaying what actually happened in history in favor of, of people in groups who really didn't impact history that much, but it makes them feel good to learn about it. Oh, you have to be careful how you talk about those things too. But the reality is my kids, I think, are getting a better education than a lot of kids and even a lot of private schools will get. And one day my kids will be called boss as a result. And their academic uh, background that they're getting in high school will be able to open doors for them in colleges, particularly my daughter, who's good in math and interested in engineering. She will probably get a lot of doors open for her by virtue of being a girl who's interested in those things that a time society is all about diversity. She'll be able to take advantage of it. Good for her. Don't want my kid to be at an advantage or at a disadvantage. But I don't know that we need to tell our kids these days to go go to college. And I also don't think that a lot of colleges with historic reputations of excellence are really living up to those historic reputations. And over time, uh, that's going to find people out. My final note on this is that when I graduated and I ultimately got a job at CNN, I was deeply self-conscious about having uh, been a, a middle Georgia lawyer who went to a middle Georgia university that few people had ever heard of. And I was on television with people who'd worked on presidential campaigns, who had worked in Congress and in the white house, who had gone to Harvard and Yale uh, and, and uh, to Princeton and all the Ivy league colleges. Maybe they've, they've taught at Oxford. And I realized that these people really don't know more than me. And to some degree, they're so detached from the world around them. They can't talk about things I can Uh, And my background actually, I think, gave me an advantage in dealing with a lot of these people. And frankly, I found out a lot of them weren't as smart as they seemed to think they were. I was stunned to be able to hold my own in those situations. And I, I, I don't think you have to go to the Ivy League to be successful. And increasingly, you don't have to go to college at all to be successful. Now, before I get out of here and get get to to Eden Pure, I want to get to Bill's call. Bill, welcome to the program. Hey, Eric. I've missed you, man. I've been paying attention to college football playoffs. And, oh, uh, way more important stuff. <laughs> but 
Yeah, today was a great show. You Thank got you. it wrong on optimism versus pessimism. Ah. The glass is neither the glass is neither half full nor half empty. Clearly, the glass is simply too large. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a way to look at it. That that's a way to look at it. Although, you, you know, I mean, nowadays they they want everybody to get a piece of the pie. They want even bigger and bigger glasses, which makes it emptier and emptier for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> look, Bill, I appreciate Absolutely. it very much, and, and and I'm glad your priorities are with football. I don't know what I'm going to do with football season coming to an end uh, until baseball season starts. I, I just I don't know. The, the, yeah, the only time I watch professional is the playoffs. And uh, yeah. I actually enjoyed this past weekend's games. And those I'll, games I'll have been them. good. I, I do think Philip, who works for me, is turning me into a hockey fan, and I'm going to have to like declare allegiance to a hockey team at some point. <laughs> All right. Well, long ashes to you, brother. Long ashes. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. All right. Now I got to tell you about Eden Pure, the Eden Pure Thunderstorm. It is the air purifier of choice in my house for eliminating odors when I'm frying or we got something stinky in the house. It works. It eliminates the odors, but it doesn't just do that. It eliminates the bacteria, the mold, the mildew that's floating around in the air, and it's filterless. You don't need a subscription to get new air filters put into your air purifier. You just wipe it out. It's great. Electrostatic. Now, what you do is you go to EdenPureDeals.com. You click on my name, Eric Erickson, and you'll see the Eden Pure Thunderstorm. And right now you get the three-pack. And in getting the three-pack, one for upstairs, one for downstairs, one for the basement or your car, your RV, wherever, you can get them, three of them, for less than $200. That's actually a savings of $200, and you get free shipping. All you do is go to EdenPureDeals.com, click on my name, put them in your cart, and then at checkout, you'll see a discount code box. And you put in ERIC3, E-R-I-C-K, and the number three. No space. Don't spell out three. Just the number three, ERIC3. And you'll get $200 off. You'll get all three of them for less than $200. You'll get free shipping. It's the Eden Pure Thunderstorm at EdenPureDeals.com, and the checkout code is ERIC3. Well, the New York Times <clears throat> has a shocking report. It shouldn't be a shocking report to any of us, but the New York Times is shocked, shocked, I tell you, and appalled, both shocked and appalled, to find out you can still buy incandescent light bulbs in the United States. Old-fashioned, inefficient light bulbs live on at the nation's dollar stores. How dare they? The subtitle says it all. A Trump administration weakening of climate rules has kept incandescent bulbs on store shelves and research shows they're concentrated in shops serving poorer areas. You would think maybe instead of being outraged, they might have a little sympathy for poor people in this country. For all the complaining the left does about inequalities in America. They sure do want to perpetuate the inequalities and cost taxes on poor people, particularly in the name of climate change. The incandescent light bulb, one of history's great inventions, is cheaper than the LED bulbs, the lead bulbs, and cheaper than the compact fluorescent light bulbs, for which if you drop and shatter them, it's a hazmat issue. And so dollar stores, dollar generals, and the like, they're continuing to sell the incandescent bulbs to poor people. And the good folks at the New York Times can't really seem to understand why people would buy these shorter-lasting incandescent bulbs. Maybe because you can get them for pennies on the dollar as opposed to the lead bulbs. At least Hiroko Tabuchi at the New York Times is trying to explain to people that um, while the bulbs are highly inefficient and shorter lasting, they are cheap. And so people buy them. It's a pattern repeated nationwide. Research has shown that lower end retailers like dollar stores or convenience shops still extensively stock their shelves with traditional or halogen incandescent bulbs. Even a store serving more affluent communities have shifted to selling the more efficient LEDs. A Michigan study, for example, found that not only were LED bulbs less available in poorer areas, they tend to cost on average $2.50 more per bulb than in wealthier communities. The reality here, though, is that LED bulbs are more expensive overall, and the environmentalists are perfectly happy taxing poor people so that the rich white progressives can feel virtuous about their climate change policies, even as the poor get poorer because of them.
it's 2022 and guess what? Nothing still makes sense. The whole world seems to be going crazy right now and banks have gotten really skittish at helping small businesses. They're perfectly happy to help the giant businesses, but what about you? You're a small business. You got to buy a building or build a building, or you need a big loan for a fleet of vehicles to grow your business and the banks are giving you a hard time. Check out my friends at First Liberty Building and Loan. They can help you nationwide, wherever you are. If you're a small business and you need access to loans, let's say 500,000 and up, First Liberty can do it. They've been doing this since the early 90s. The Frost family are friends of mine. They're committed Christians and they're great business people and they are committed to small businesses. Reach out to them. FirstLibertyGA.com is their website. FirstLibertyGA.com. Spend 10 minutes with them. See if they're a good fit for you. See if you're a good fit for them. They want to help you get to yes where the big banks are saying no. Nationwide, they can help you if you're a small business. FirstLibertyGA.com is the website. FirstLibertyGA.com. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, avoid, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus.